I became an anarchist mainly, and not because of the ecological issue, let me make that very plain, mainly because I was following what seemed to me to be a very distinct historical trajectory. I had been formed by the 1930s, the era so-called Red Decade, when the workers' movement was very, very a very important fact in life. It seemed as though the American working class and the European working class and elsewhere would change the world. And I went into union organizing in the 1930s and went into industry as soon as I became of age, worked in foundries, under very, very difficult conditions, worked in auto plants, went on strikes, and by 1948 I came to the conclusion that the workers were not going to change the world. That's number one. But the second consideration which was very important with me was that the Marxian class analysis did not seem to cover the whole area of oppressions that I thought had to be eliminated, specifically Oppressions based on gender, patriarchy, for example. Oppressions based on color. Oppressions based not on class, but on hierarchies. So I was not only concerned, after having been a Marxist for many, many years, I was not only concerned now with economic exploitation, I was also concerned with social domination. And Marxism gave me no adequate method or response to this kind of question, but anarchism did. So in a sense, I partly borrowed from and invented my own anarchism to cover the problems of hierarchy. In other words, problems which were later to become very pronounced in the 1960s. Patriarchy, which is not strictly economic. Age oppressions, which are not strictly economic. Oppressions based on color, which are not strictly economic. Oppressions based on bureaucracy, and above all, the increasing power of the state in public life. And the anarchists, or anarchism as a tradition, seemed to me to be the best response and the best approach I could possibly develop toward dealing with these questions. The question of domination, not only of exploitation. What would exist even if you abolished class society as a residual form of oppression, notably hierarchy, which I felt the anarchist tradition addressed more correctly and more fully than Marxism. As to the question of work, do you believe that work is inherently hierarchical? No. That is another great quarrel I had with Marxism. Frederick Engels, Marx's famous collaborator, had written a work called <clears throat> On Authority. It was an outstandingly disgusting work. <laughs> Why? He tried to argue that in order to operate, say, a steel plant, if my memory is correct, you would have to have hierarchy. That is to say, you would have to have a system of command and obedience in order to organize the plant. Now, I have worked in steel. <laughs> I have seen how workers can do, through their own self-organization, the necessary productive activity and even more effective than under a, hierarchic, a hierarchical system, the necessary work coordination on their own. So I knew, first of all, that Engels didn't know what the heck he was talking about, even though he himself had been a capitalist in his, uh, throughout his mature years. As people should know, Engels was an, a textile manufacturer and provided Marx with a livelihood from part of the profits that he got. But very important was the compelling notion that under a socialist or communist society we would have to have hierarchy. And secondly, there's also the notion that existed in Marx. In volume three of Capital and in the Grundrisse, these are major works of Marx, obviously, which many Marxists read, or at least profess to read. Marx emphasized that there would always have to be a realm of necessity. Somebody would have to do the dirty work, be it coal mining, cleaning up the garbage, blah, 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 blah. And that for him, freedom began when you left your job. <laughs> you see? When you left your job, then you would remove your overalls or you remove your work clothing and get into your nice, how shall we put it, free clothing, colorful clothing, and live <clears throat> in the realm of freedom. 
Now, bit by bit, I began to object to that. I began to see how it could be possible with new technologies and with an entirely new atmosphere, even in factories, to make more work more pleasant and more playful. And how machinery could begin to replace the most onerous types of work, which con constituted Marx's realm of necessity. I shifted more and more over, almost unknowingly, to Fourier, Charles Fourier, the great French utopian, more and more unknowingly to the idea that the realm of necessity could be colonized by the realm of freedom, that play could be brought into work. <clears throat> and I had many dramatic examples of that. My mother, who came, was born in Russia, had seen peasants harvesting, and the way they did that was with a sense of joy. They brought vodka with them, they brought food with them, and they turned harvesting into a picnic. This was in a pre-industrial society. And I wondered, why couldn't we extend this whole phenomenon to the experience as a whole, the whole work experience? In other words, turn work into something that is much more playful, much more joyous, much more self-expressive. So consequently, again, I fell back on what I would call the anarchic utopian tradition. And that, too, reinforced my anarchism. Going back to, um, <coughs> sorry, going back to work and play, are there, um, are there any other specific examples that you can think of where um, your ideas, anarchism, particular, sorry, what am I trying to say? What I would like is more um, specific um, experiences that you may have had with um, organising or being part of non-hierarchical work and, and work and play. Craftsmanship, craftspersonship is a very striking example. I could envision, and I also saw to a great extent, the way in which machinery could replace most of the onerous aspects of work, most of the demanding aspects of work. And where, for example, in the case of gardening, gardening or the cultivation of food could become more playful if it was scaled to human dimensions instead of agribusiness with its sweeping machinery going across endless fields of the same crop, how it would be possible. And I had this as a direct experience, not uh, something that I had to read about, how gardening could, in a sense, become almost like a dance. Certainly, it was much better physically than jogging. <laughs> If you wanted to do exercise, if you wanted to engage in exercise, what could be more wondrous than weeding a garden? What could be more wondrous than planting? What could be more wondrous than supervising the growth of a garden or supervising the cultivation of food? That this need not be work that is really uh, the product of the sweat of your brow. That in fact collectively, particularly as a collective, Work could be done more joyously. And some of our finest work songs come out of collective efforts. I have a whole repertoire of Russian folk songs which have to do with work. Peasants gathering together and cultivating food. And peasants singing and feasting and doing all kinds of things in addition to harvesting so that a work day became a joyous experience and almost a fulfilling one. Tolstoy in uh, the novel Anna Karenina has a wonderful passage where his real hero, Levin, who is really Tolstoy, of course, is watching peasants go to work. And the image he creates, which is a very real image, since I, 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 I did not have to read Tolstoy to get that image, I got it from my mother when she lived in Russia and lived amidst the peasantry. So, gives you an image of Sasha and Sergei, come, we have to do this and do that, have a drink of vodka, and so on and so on and so forth. And people are singing as they are working. And you know, agricultural work, leaving mining aside, is supposed to be the work that is above all